witness 30 years of magic in pictures with Mark Rosewater. Hello, everybody. Are you seeing? Oops. Oh. Are you guys seeing the screen? You're seeing me. Sorry, a little editing. Uh. OK. OK, welcome, everyone. So welcome to Magic 30, celebrating 30 years of magic. Now, I know if you do the math, uh, we're actually at 29 years. But we're so excited for next year. We're starting a little bit early. Uh, but we do acknowledge that uh, you know, next year is officially 30 years. OK, so when I was asked to do a talk, uh, they came up to me and they said, we want you to do a panel. You have an hour. And I'm like, OK, wh what do you want me to do? And they're like, well, it's, the 30, it's 30 years. Can we celebrate 30 years? And I'm like, yeah, I'd definitely like to do that. And they're like, could you make it visual? I said, yeah. So for 30 years, I've been part of Magic. Uh, in that time, I've been in a lot of pictures. So I thought, what if I chose 30 of those pictures to capture those 30 years? And then for each of them, I could tell the story. What if I did an hour of that? And they said, that sounds good. So that's what we're going to do. So I've picked 30 pictures that are representative of 30 years. So picture number one. So these, I believe, are chronological. They're not one per year, uh, but they do go in chronological order. OK, so this, this picture took place at Gen Con in 1994. Uh, it was the very first Magic World Championship. It was the only non-invite only. Anybody could play in it. Uh, it used the vintage format, or as we called it back then, magic. Uh, it had eight 64-person flights. Um, anybody could play in them. I played in one. Uh, and it was single elimination. So you lost one match, and you were out. Uh, and then the top eight advanced to a 64-person finals held on the final day. Now, it had almost no trappings that you would find nowadays. For example, no tablecloths. And those are boxes. <laughs> e OK. Um, in the end, Bertrand Lestray of France played Zach Dolan of the United States. And you can tell it's the finals because they have a tablecloth. <laughs> um, so in the end, they played best of three. Zach Dolan was. He beat um, two to one, he beat Patron, and he won this amazing trophy. OK, so now, this is where I enter the picture. So all of these pictures, I'm in all of these pictures because I'm telling you personal stories of things that happened to me. So these are all about me, uh, stories that I take place in. Um, so I started playing in Alpha. Uh, and in January of 1994, I picked up the very first issue of the Duelist magazine. For those who might not know what a magazine is, uh, we used to print things about magic on paper that you could buy. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed The Duelist, but I felt that it didn't have a lot of content for advanced players. So I wrote to the company, and I pitched the idea for a puzzle column. So kind of based on chess puzzles. You're in the middle of a game. Hey, you got to do, usually you win. You got to do something. Um, and my puzzle started showing up in The Duelist supplement, AKA Duelist one and a half. Now, I really enjoyed doing the puzzles, and they were very fun for me, but I kind of wanted to do more with magic. So I flew myself to Gen Con that year because I wanted to meet with Catherine Haynes, who was the editor in chief of The Duelist. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to write more. I was a writer, and so I said to her, Could I write things in The Duelist? And she said to me, Give me a good story, and yeah, you can do it. So I pitched her the idea for a column about magic through the lens, I'm sorry, um, Gen Con through the lens of a magic player. 
Now, MTG didn't exactly catch on, um, but part of that was we covered the World Championships. And what I said I would do is not just cover it, but I would actually do play-by-play. -play. I would record everything that happened, and I wrote it up for something called the Duelist Companion. Uh, the DCI stands for Duelist Communication International. They had a newsletter back in the day. But anyway, um, that's what I'm doing in this picture. I'm there covering the finals. So it's me and my underdog shirt in the background of what's become a very famous picture of the finals. That's why I'm there. Um, so the reason I chose this picture was it was kind of the start of a lot of things. For, for Magic, it was the start of tournaments, of organized play. Obviously, we're having the World Championship here this weekend. Um, for me personally, this was the thing that I did that got my foot in the door. And these articles led to other projects that led to freelance things. And that eventually got me working at Wizards. So in a lot of ways, this picture is the start of a lot of things. OK, picture number two. This one I have to explain because it doesn't make much sense as a picture. So back in the early days of the Pro Tour, I used to do play-by-play. -play, and I would pick a random pro, or not a random pro, but I would pick a pro to do color. Uh, and I did, for the first like year and a half of the Pro Tour, I, I did the commentary. Um, one of the people I loved doing commentary with was a man named Mark Justice. Uh, I knew him. He had won the Southwest Regionals back when I was running tournaments in Los Angeles. Uh, he won the US Nationals in 1994 that I'd been at. Um, and he and I would often do play, uh, commentary together. I would do play-by-play, -play, he would do color. So anyway, this story takes place on the Queen Mary uh, at Pro Tour Los Angeles. So th this was the second ever Pro Tour. The first one was in New York, the second one was in Los Angeles. Uh, and the Queen Mary, for those that have never been there, it literally is, is, is a ship, it was a cruise ship that, uh, that went back and forth across, and eventually they stopped cruising with it and they made it into a hotel in Long Beach, California. And a lot of the pro tours were held there. So this very first pro tour held in Los Angeles was Sean Hammer Regner versus Tom Gavin, both from America. And they, there, there was a nine hour top eight, including a five hour finals between the two of them. Now, um, if you've ever seen commentary, they make these booths for the commentators, kind of spa spacey booths that you can do commentator in that have the name of the you know, pro tour behind it. Uh, but this was very early in the Pro Tour. On the Queen Mary, we'd never been there before. So the only place they could find that they could capture the sound was in a phone booth. <laughs> so this picture, and it's the only picture I could find, is me and Mark Justice doing nine hours of commentary in a phone booth. Um, I almost called out for pizza. Um, the reason I picked this picture is we've come so far uh, Magic has gotten a lot more polished, but when you look at the history of Magic, there's a lot of fun early days where things weren't quite as polished as they once become. So right now, while we might have these spacious booths, there was a time where we did the commentary in a phone booth. Uh, so one of the things I'm doing today is I'm going to do some previews for you guys. So I'm going to show you a lot of retro frames. So these are existing Magic cards. Uh, for Brothers War in a retro frame, and then on the right side is the schematic version, which is a special version that shows like, what it would look like if you made schematics for that object. So uh, in honor of uh, Mark Justice and I being caged in the phone booth, uh, here is Caged Sun. OK, picture number three. So let me talk about who these are. First up is Bill Rose. Uh, Bill Rose is current the VP of Tabletop Magic. He's uh, one of the main guys that runs Magic now. Next is Henry Stern. He was the first person we ever took off the Pro Tour to work at Magic. Next is Mike Elliott. He, wa he holds the, 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 he's the second most record for the most designs ever led. I have number one by a pretty wide margin, but he, he still has number two. William Jockish was the first uh, developer, play designer we ever hired, who used to do a lot of our early playtesting. And Joel Mick was the first head designer. Um, it was Joel Mick, then Bill Rose, and me. Those are the three Magic head designers. Um, so anyway, this picture took place. My dad used to have a cat. My dad's still alive. He just doesn't live there anymore. My dad used to have a, a place up in Lake Tahoe. Oh, I'm sorry, 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 I'm jumping ahead. Um, to give you a little sense of scope, um, about how many people work at Wizards full time. So in 1997, it was six people. It was all the people in that picture. That was all of Magic R&D at the time, full time Magic R&D. Now we have 50 people. So to give you a little sense of scope between the now and then. 
And my dad had this place, and so we would often go up. All, all of Magic RD would go and visit my dad. Uh, sometimes we go in the summer, sometimes in the winter we go skiing. Uh, and during that trip, my, uh, at the time my girlfriend, now my wife, Laura, said, hey, why don't we take a picture? So we took a picture of the six of us. It's on the balcony of my dad's house. And I framed this picture, and it's been sitting in my basement. It's, it, uh, it's been there for, uh, since 1997. Um, and the reason I picked this picture was one of the things that's really nice about looking back is seeing one, where we once were. And I have a lot of very fond memories. This is the first group I ever worked with. I've worked with a lot, a lot of talented designers over the years, and they were great to work with. But there's something going back to the, the very beginning. And these were, to me, kind of the original, the original team that I worked with. Picture number four. So this story also takes place on the Queen Mary a year later from the last Queen Mary, Pro Tour 1997. So Magic had been a little more established. We got a little better at dressing up the boat. Um, so this final was Tommy Hovey from Finland versus David Mills from the United States. So what happened in this finals is David Mills had this bad habit. He would play spells before he would tap his mana. Shocker, I know. Um, in fact, this whole incident led us to change the rules so that you now don't have to do that. So if you ever wonder why you don't have to do that, it's this story. Anyway, he kept doing it. He kept getting warnings from the judge. And the judges say, one more time, and that's it. And then he was about to win the whole tournament. He drew the card he needed. He was so excited, he just played the card before tapping his mana. And then Tom Wiley, the head judge in the background there, called us to the side. And it was Tom Wiley and myself. Um, Andrew Finch was the tournament organizer. Henry Stern was there, Scaff Elias. And we had this major discussion about, are we really supposed to kick someone out of the Pro Tour for what was kind of a minor issue? I mean, he had kept doing it. It kept getting escalated. But are we really going to disqualify somebody? So in the end, Andrew Finch, who was the tournament organizer, decided, yes, we were going to DQ him. We did DQ him with um, his prize money. That was a change from policy, but we did DQ him, and Tommy Hovey went on to win this Pro Tour. So the reason I picked this picture, and it's a very famous Magic picture from Magic history, is this was the exact moment that David Mills find out he's disqualified from the Pro Tour. <laughs> By the way, that's me in black. I'm in all these pictures. Some of them I'm very subtly in the picture, but that, that's me in black. That's where I am in the picture. A young me. Oh, by the way, the reason, oops, the reason I picked that picture um, was there's a, there's a lot of classic moments that happen in Magic that no one could see coming. And this was one of those. We've never, and since then, we've never had a DQ based on, on this. So, uh, and there was a near riot. It was, it was a really crazy event that happened. And this picture really captured that moment in time. And it's become one of the classic sort of Pro Tour pictures. So I wanted to include it. Okay, picture number five. Um, so this is me. Uh, I dressed up like a chicken yesterday, so apparently I like dressing up like chickens. Uh, this happened at Gen Con in 1998. Uh, so Unglued was coming out, the very first onset. And so we had a meeting. We were brainstorming. There was going to be a pre-release at Gen Con that year. That was the only pre-release was at Gen Con. And we were trying to come up with cool, fun things we could do. So uh, there was a chicken theme in the set. So as part of our brainstorming, I said I could head judge in a chicken suit all brainstorming stopped. They're like, that is what we're doing. Uh, and the next thing I know, I'm head judging in a chicken suit. So uh, I, for two days, I, I ran. I was in the chicken suit. Um, I, I, these are pictures, by the way, no one has seen. I, I went down and tracked these pictures down. Um, in fact, the first picture only existed in a very fuzzy form, and I found the original. So we got a non-fuzzy person. Um, I actually got sick. This, the suit was dusty. I got pneumonia. But anyway, this is something that was, uh, became a classic of the unsets. Uh, so I, the, I dressed up as a chicken. Uh, so for Unglue, uh, I'm sorry, Unhinged, which was at Gen Con SoCal, for a while Gen Con was in, LA, uh, sorry, in Los Angeles in addition to being in um, Indianapolis or Gen, um, Milwaukee before that. Uh, and so Unhinged had a donkey theme. So I dressed up as a donkey. For Unstable, I was at the Loading Ready Run pre-release. -pre I dressed up as a squirrel. For the Unfinity announcement, I dressed up as an astronaut. Oh, and a quick funny story about this one is um, that's an actual astronaut helmet. I got an astronaut jumpsuit and helmet. And when the wardrobe person gave me the helmet, they said to me, 
uh, the people that gave it to them said, don't leave this on too long or you'll lose oxygen and you'll collapse. So I said, how long is that? And she goes, oh, they didn't tell me. <laughs> so I, I managed not to collapse, so that was good. Uh, the reason I picked this picture is Magic has a lot of really fun moments in it. The, the head judging in the chicken suit was really, I mean, people still talk about it today. It's why I wore the chicken suit yesterday. And it's kind of part of magic history. And so I wanted to include that. Picture number six. Okay, so this is the Magic Invitational. So for those that might not remember the Magic Invitational, it was the all-star game. It ran for 11 years. Um, the prize was you got to make a magic card and then your picture appeared on it. Uh, 11 cards got made because there were 11 tournaments. Uh, these are 10 of them, the other one's coming. Uh, so what, the way it worked is we took 16 of the best known Magic pros, we played 15 rounds in what's called a round robin tournament, meaning everybody plays every other player once. Uh, there were five different formats, a lot of which were brand new, I made them up. The players had never played them before. So anyway, this story takes place in 2002. This was the seventh Invitational. So the first six Invitationals, we, we went around the world. We were in Hong Kong, we were in Rio de Janeiro, we were in Barcelona, we were in Kuala Lumpur, we were in Sydney, we were in Cape Town. We'd actually been to every continent outside North America, save Antarctica. Um, but anyway, Chris Galvin at the time, who was the head of the organized play department, called me into his office. And he said to me, he goes, Mark, I want you to know, I really like the Invitational. I think it's a great event. We have no budget for it. So while I really would like to see it happen, there's no money. Um, so I'm like, okay. But Chris said he, would he wanted it to happen. So I'm like, okay, how do I make this happen? So it turns out my savior was Magic Online. So Magic Online had just started and they were looking for a big event. Well, I had a big event and I needed some money. So it all worked out. We ended up doing it at Wizards headquarters because we were trying to do it on the cheap and it was going to be on Magic Online. So us being at Wizards didn't matter too much. Um, and anyway, Jens Turen um, from Sweden would go on to win. You guys might recognize his card. Uh, Salam Simulacrum, he won for doing it. Um, and the reason I picked this picture, A, I wanted a nod to the Invitational, which has a warm place in my heart. But B, it really goes to show that you never know that things could happen that, you know, I, the, when Chris told me we had no money, I'm like, how in the world is this going to happen? But the fact is we managed to make it happen. There's a lot of stories in Magic where we didn't know how, but we made it happen. So that's why I included this picture. And because we were the host of the tournament at Wizards of the Coast, I thought I would show off Helm of the Host. So once again, the left is the retro version, and the right is the retro with the schematic. So Helm of the Host will be in Brothers War. Picture number seven. So for many years, I was a judge. In fact, I was a level four judge for many years. I did a lot of interviewing of judges. I was one of the people that helped set up the judge program in the early days. Um, and the vast majority of my judging was at the first eight years of the Pro Tour, I was in charge of the feature matches. I picked all the feature matches. I was sort of the head judge of the feature match area. I, other judges would work with me. Um, but my story about being uh, the feature match judge was one year we decided to introduce this play mat. The idea was we were going to we have televised finals and we thought it'd be easier if people, if there was like a court, like tennis has a court, basketball has a court, if there were just defined areas where you, you knew where to put things so that the audience could watch it and be easier to watch. But in order to use this on camera, we needed to tra train the players to use it. So the idea we came up with was, why not in the feature match area? because all the people that would get to the finals tended to go through the feature match area. Um, the final days of the feature matches were all the top people in contention. And so we used that, we put the match there so we could train people. So do you want to know what the troublesome part of teaching people to use this was? This. So it turns out that one side the deck is on the right and one side the deck is on the left. Pros knew where their land went. They knew where the, th everything was fine. They'd go in the red zone to attack. But my deck has to be on the right? What are you talking about? My deck's on the left. So we made a rule that said, whoever didn't win play draw could pick what side they sat on. And then someone said, wait a minute. I won, can I pick what side I'm on? I care about that more than play draw. And so I said, sure. Um, 
But anyway, the reason I, I, I picked this story was judges are the lifeblood of organized and structured competitive play. I was honored to be a judge. I, I, I learned a lot from being a judge. I worked with so many amazing, wonderful judges, and I just really wanted to tip the hat. Magic wouldn't be magic with all the judges and the hard work they do. And so this picture really was a nod to all the hard work of the judges. What the hell is that? That's not part of the uniform. Oh, this, sir, it's barbed wire. Why the hell are you wearing barbed wire, private? Uh, the demon style guide calls for all Oni to wear barbed wire, you know, because we like pain. Oni? What the hell is an Oni? A Japanese demon, sir, since the next block is Jap Japanese. Maro! Yes, sir? What the hell are you doing to me, Maro? So I picked this. This is the first time I remember appearing in a comic strip as a character. I was a little, uh, uh, this was in the comic uh, UG Madness, Blue Green Madness, uh, made by Jason Everill. And he made me a demon spawn. <laughs> um, now I was actually touched. I thought it was very funny. I actually contacted Jason. I, I gave him my blessing. I said, I thought I, I really was honored to be there. And then I became a regular character <laughs> in Blue Green Madness. Um, and just whenever he wanted to make a joke about wizards, I, I was kind of the face of that. Um, and that wasn't the only time. There had been a lot of comics out there. Uh, and one of the side effects of being the face of magic is I literally am the face of magic. And so I've shown up in a lot of different comic strips. Um, also, there's a lot of fans out there that love to do art. I've been the source of lots of different pieces of art over the years. Um, and the reason I chose this was one of the great things about the magic community is all of the stuff that the community makes. Yeah, Wizards does lots of stuff too, but the community generates all of this really fun content out there. And it's kind of been an honor to be sort of tangentially part of that. And when I show up in the strips, I'm, I'm honored by it. I, you know, I, I think it's fun. I take no offense. Lots of jokes are done my, you know, at my offense, and it's fine. I actually think it's very funny. So that's why I picked this picture. Picture number nine. So this takes place at the 2005 World Championships in Yokohama, Japan. So the 2005 World Individual Champion was Katsuhiro Mori of Japan. The 2005 World Team Champions were Team Japan. And the 2005 Pro Player of the Year was Kenji Samura, also of Japan. So a triple crown. Only the United States had ever done that before, and it was a big deal, and we were in Japan. It was the first time the Triple Crown happened, I think, in the home country. Um, or, let's I take it back. 98 US did it, but the second time it ever happened. Um, but there was one match the Japanese didn't win, and these were the three men that did it. <laughs> Richard Garfield, Aaron Forsyth, and me. So here's the story. They had a league for high scores in Japan, and the prize for winning it was you got to come to the World Championships in Chiba and play an all-star studded Wizards team, which happened to be the three of us. It used uh, what we called a, a standard, all three decks together had to be standard legal. Aaron, Aaron Forsythe built them. Richard lost his match really quickly. <laughs> Aaron won his match very quickly. So I was literally in the first game, it's best of three, when they both finished. So it was all on my shoulders. Now, I don't play competitive magic. This is literally the only time ever that anything ever relied on my magic playing skills. Uh, I lost the first match. I won the second. So it came down to the final game. Now, both our decks used a card called Eladomri's Call, which let you go into your deck and get creatures. So kind of what we call a toolbox deck, where you go and get the creature you need. So I'm playing game three against my opponent. Turn two, he plays Eladomri's Call. If you've ever played this mirror match, that is a bad, bad thing to happen. Um, and he goes and gets Maro. <laughs> now, it was turn two, and I'm like, oh, I guess he had a turn three play, and he must have the land. Turn three comes, he doesn't play, he plays his third land, but he doesn't play a creature. Turn four comes, he doesn't play a land, uh, and I go on to win this match. And I joked that I was the only person that could win it because the only reason he didn't win is he wanted to beat me with me. And had it been anybody else, he would have got a three drop and won the game. And so, uh, so the reason I picked this is 
This was a fun moment. Literally, it's the only time anything was ever on the line for my magic playing skills. And I didn't even win it because of my magic playing skills. Uh, I just had a card named after me, so. Um, but I picked this picture because I, it's a fun story and I, I remember that, so. Okay, the next picture. So Wizards of the Coast, uh, for a long time, has worked in the building you see in this picture. So I have a, you might know this, I have an article called Making Magic uh, that I started back in 2002. In fact, this year is the 20th anniversary of Making Magic. I've written over a thousand articles. So I got the idea one day, I wanted to show off the new building, so I took my wife, Laura, Laura was not my wife at this point, and we went on a, on a weekend and we just took a camera, I had a little whiteboard where I wrote notes on, uh, and I just went around the building and showed off, I, I didn't even know what order it was gonna go in, I didn't know which pictures I would use, I just took lots and lots of pictures of just showing off different things, I made jokes, I was just messing around, um, but I was just showing off the office, uh, I showed neat things that were in the office I thought was cool. Um, I told little stories about like little inside jokes about things. Uh, and I ended up putting, I, I, so in the end I picked 80 pictures and I made an article called 80,000 words. That's called the picture's worth a thousand words. So it was 80 pictures. Um, and that was, um, it went over really, really well. And the reason I picked this was um, a, it taught me the importance of being visual, but B, it was one of my most po popular articles ever, and I, I literally wrote no words. There was no words, I mean, I wrote some words on the blackboard, I guess, but, you know, it was, a, it was an article of 80 pictures, and the idea is that that would be something. I love the innovation that magic can have, and I love how part of, the, of making magic is finding innovative to do things, and I, I really enjoyed this one article because it just showed how innovation, you can make something you never think you would do, and that magic has done that time and time again. Okay, the next picture. So this took place at the 2010 World Championships in Chiba, Japan. Oh, I'm sorry, the last one was not Chiba, the last one was at Yokohama. It said that on the slide, but I, I, I missed the book. Um, so anyway, we do a thing called Massive Magic, where we play with giant cards that are like two and a half to three feet tall. They're so big that each card is manned by an audience member. And this is the story of my favorite Massive Magic game. So, um, Basically, it was me versus uh, Richard Garfield. Mirrodin Besiege was about to come out. And so we decided to have Team Mirrodin versus Team Frexia. So Richard was the captain of Team Mir Mirrodin. I was the captain of Team Frexia. Uh, and we, we showed off preview cards and we did all sorts of cool stuff. But basically, if you remember, uh, uh, this set was all about a war between um, Mirren and New Frexia, and we didn't tell you the name of the last set. Like, you didn't know the outcome of the war, so we were playing that up. Um, it went well for Frexia. We were winning. Um, and it looked like Richard was about to lose. So he pulled off his shirt to show a Frexian shirt and revealed he was a double agent. <laughs> but then the Frexian team, I mean, the Mirren team, went on to pull back there were some very anti-Phyrexian judges who were making questionable calls, in my opinion. Uh, but, but Mirrodin managed to come back. So then Richard put back on his shirt, said he'd been a triple agent, and that had been part of the plan all along. But I managed, the Phyrexian onslaught cannot be stopped. I gave uh, Richard 10 poison counters, and we were victorious. Uh, kind of a little hint of things to come. Uh, everybody got to keep their cards. And for novelty, we signed them with a giant pen. Um, I picked this picture because this is my, my favorite Massive Magic story. I, I love a lot of the events that we do. Uh, I, I always have fun doing stuff with Richard. And this was what's a really, really fun event. I just wanted to, it's a fun story I wanted to tell. Next up, so the, these uh, fine people were the finalists of the Great Designer Search 2. So there actually were three great designer searches. I just like that picture best, so I picked that as my picture. But we did three different searches. So the way this came about was my boss back in the day was Randy Bueller. Uh, and Randy said to me, uh, oh, I said to Randy, we need more designers. He goes, well, tell me how we get more designers. And I said, well, the Pro Tour, which is where Randy came from, was really good at finding developers, play designers, but not that good for finding designers. And so my wife and I watch a lot of reality television. And there's this whole genre of you get people really good at something and you test them every week and then you vote them out. 
And I said, could we do that? And Randy said, okay. So we did three great designer searches. Thousands of people applied each time. There was all sorts of ways to narrow them down. We had a, a true reality show. We had every week there were tests. We'd cut people out. And in the end, uh, there were three finalists for each of the three, uh, each of the different events. All nine finalists got hired full time at Wizards. Not, not all immediately, but all did get hired. They led the design for 44 different magic products, including vision design for the upcoming set, The Brothers War. Ari did that. And all have been on over 200 different magic teams. So the reason I picked this picture is hey, part of magic is thinking out of the box, finding new ways to do things. Uh, we actually won an award from Hasbro for innovation for this. So I was very proud of the great designer search. I hope one day to have a fourth one. Uh, I've got a lot of great, truly, truly great designers out of it. Okay, picture number 13. Morrow reads his email. Dear Evil Incarnate, it sickens me how your bloated ego has systematically destroyed everything that was awesome about magic. By the way, I would love to get a job there. Any tips? Uh, so this story starts back literally on April 12th, 2011. Ethan had just started because he had just won. Ethan had won the second great designer search. Um, and we had this habit back then, a little tradition, that whenever we had a successful set, we would have cake. Nowadays, we don't get cake. There's too many sets, I guess. Um, but we used to have cake. And there was a new app I found uh, for my phone that turned a photograph into what looked like a comic book page. And so I, I posted this comic, and people liked it. So the next day, I posted another one, and I started calling this Tales from the Pit. Um, I do it five times a week, and I've done over 2,500 comics. Uh, I've had a chance to do a lot of really fun things. For example, I get to go behind the scenes. I get to poke fun at wizards. This is a very famous, I, I, I did a whole bunch of these where I play up that we love to talk about things that have nothing to do with magic and waste our time. Um, I've done a lot of comics based on memes. There's this meme that is my job to kill magic, but somehow I don't do it very well. Um, I like to use it to talk about other people. There's a great community with magic. Evan Irwin's a perfect example. Uh, and Evan, for example, was ending one of his shows, so I thought it'd be funny to do a comic about how most people end things, but I never seem to. Um, and I also do comics about the ca cards themselves. And whenever I see a chance for a good pun, I will always take it. Yes. <laughs> Um, the reason I picked this is I, th I think it's important when looking at magic to have a humorous take on things, to have a sense of humor, and I really enjoyed how this comic has let me have a humorous take at what we do, and so I picked it because it was, it was fun. <laughs> okay, picture number 14. So this took place at the 2011 World Championship in San Francisco at the Fort Mason Center. So I was doing something called a deck clinic, we used to do a thing where people would bring their decks and we would help fix them up to make them better, or something we used to do. Um, and this woman came dressed up, dressed like Elsbeth. Now, back in the day, that wasn't really a thing you saw at magic events. Cosplaying really wasn't a thing yet. So it was really exciting to see somebody dressed up as Elsbeth. So this was Christine Sprankle. I hope you guys know. Um, so she, she's gone on to do lots and lots of magic cosplaying. She and I have become really good friends. And not only did she do it, but I, she really inspired cosplaying as being a magic thing. And so one of the cool things now is whenever I go to events, I get to see all these amazing cosplayers. And I love taking pictures with cosplayers. And so everywhere I go now, it's just awesome. It's really awesome to see the love that cosplaying has. Um, I enjoy, this is a, a nod also to the amazing work of our creative teams, of making all these cool characters that people really care about. Uh, and the reason I chose this picture was it showed how one member of the community that has a passion and follows their passion can lead to all sorts of amazing things. And then just watching Christine just show up randomly to it become, like we had all contests this weekend, an amazing contest with really beautiful costumes, that that all came from just the community being passionate. And so I wanted to include that. And I wanted it to be both a nod to our cosplaying community and to our creative team that does such a job of making amazing characters that everybody wants to dress up like them. Okay, picture number 15. Okay, so this is Sean Kornhauser and Nathan Holtz. Sean is a cameraman. Nathan is an actor. 
Uh, and the two of them went on to make something called Walking the Plains, which was hard to describe it. They did interviews. They talked about the Pro Tour. They talked about competitive play. They did sketches. Uh, there was a lot of comedy. Um, but this story is not about that exactly. So it takes place at the 2007 World Championships. So Nate and Sean had gone to a local Grand Prix and made a video that was hilarious. And they had started a Kickstarter because they wanted to make a video about Worlds that year. It happened, so they showed up at Worlds. So I contacted them and I said to them, I would like to do something with you guys. So they said, great, we'd love to interview you. And I'm like, okay, okay, I mean, you can happily interview me, I'll interview me, but I, I meant I want to go a step behind, beyond that. I'm willing to do something with you. We, I'll be part of the sketch for you. So Nate came up with this idea for a Willy Wonka sketch where I was Willy Wonka. The problem was I had to sing, and if you've never heard me sing, you're, you're well off because I can't sing. Um, so Nate came up with another idea. So here's the sketch we actually did. So Nate and I are playing magic, and I win, and I make a, I make a devilish laugh. Uh, and then Nate says, Does, can the loser pick the next game? I go, sure. And he picks basketball. <laughs> so the fun part of this story is I volunteered to do this. They said, we play basketball. I said, sure. By the way, Nate's a great basketball player. I'm horrible. So it was really good editing. It looks like I won this game. Um, but we, during the middle of Worlds, left Worlds, traveled like half a half hour away to this uh, b basketball, and we spent maybe two hours shooting this thing. Um, and I had such a good time that the deal I made with them is whenever I was in the city they were in, I would be in their video. And Nate played a character called the Wizard, and there was a running joke that the Wizard and I had it out for each other. It's kind of like a spy versus spy thing. And I did a whole bunch of like five or six videos with them, uh, and I had a blast. And so I picked this picture just because there's so much fun things. I love doing things with the community. Uh, and this was a great chance where it was me. Uh, once again, the community made something awesome. I, I helped them, and we made something fun together, and it really was a blast. And in honor of our basketball game, I thought I'd show off Defense Grid uh, as another preview of the Brothers War. So on the left, the normal uh, retro frame. The right is the schematic retro frame. OK, next up, picture number 16. So you might recognize this woman as Felicia Day. Um, she has been in lots of things. The Guild, Supernatural, Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. Um, so the important part of this story is for uh, Magic 2014, she played Chandra. So anyway, I follow her on social media. And one day, she was visited somewhere, and she was showing pictures like she was live tweeting. And she showed off this thing. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know that thing. That's in our building. She's in our building. So I looked at all the pictures and I figured out where she was. And I ran up to her and I took this picture. Um, and I, I picked this picture because one of the fun things about Magic has been there's a lot of celebrities that play games, that play Magic. And I've had it as part of my job. I've got to meet a lot of them. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and they're just the story of realizing she was in the building was such a fun one. I wanted to share it. Okay, next up, picture 17. Okay, so this took place at the World Championships in Amsterdam, Netherlands. So it was Magic's 20th anniversary, but we weren't doing much for it. We didn't do a lot for the 20th anniversary. And I, I was a little bummed, to be honest. I'm a Magic historian. Um, so one of the producers for Worlds said, hey, at Worlds this year, we're doing a video segment on Magic's 20 years. You in? I said, absolutely. I was very excited. That's all they told me about it. So I show up at, uh, in Amsterdam. So I go, so what aspect do you want me to talk about? They go, all of it. We want you to discuss every year. So I'm like, are we doing multiple segments? No, just one. Will it be a long segment? Only 20 minutes. You get a minute per year. And that's how I found out I was doing 20 years in 20 minutes. So the whole premise was I had one minute per year. They did give me one day to prepare, so I was able to prepare. This is on YouTube. You can go watch it when you get home. Um, it's very fun. It is not easy to do. Um, but the reason I picked this picture was it was a, I often get surprised and asked to do crazy things. This was one of the crazy things. It was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know why they didn't tell me ahead of time it was coming, uh, but it was a fun surprise. Um, in honor of the clock I was under, I'm showing off Unwinding Clock. Un uh, unwinding clock. So the, once again, the left is the normal retro, on the right is the schematic version. 
Picture number 18. So uh, this took place at PAX in 2015 in Seattle. Battle for Zendikar was coming out. So the Eldrazi were taking over PAX. We had this giant statue breaking out of a window and we all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and we decided to involve Will Whedon. You might know Will Whedon as an actor from Big Bang Theory, Star Trek Next Generation, Stand By Me, and lots of other cool stuff. He is a gamer, also a magic player. So we thought he would be a good fit. So what we did is we had a big presentation. So it had Will Whedon. It had Ashley Birch. Uh, she's also an actress. You might know from um, on Apple Plus, uh, Mythic, uh, Mythic Quest, she's on. Uh, a Mythic, did I say that right? Mythic Quest? Oh, she's also on Borderlands, okay. Um, anyway, Doug Beyer, who I hope you guys know, he does all, uh, a lot, he's in charge of a lot of the creative, uh, and myself. Uh, and so what happened was, Will and Ashley were the hosts. Um, Doug and Ashley did a whole segment where they were talking about the creative, why, what's going on with the Eldrazi and all that, the war and everything. And then Will and I had a segment on um, talking about the mechanics. Now, I got to look through all of our pictures, hundreds and hundreds of pictures. I looked online. This was the only picture in existence I could find with the two of us on stage, which are like way in the background we're on stage. Um, anyway, this was a big deal, a giant show. We we, it, was, it was a big spectacle. A lot of people were there live. Many more were at home watching. It was streamed. Um, so we spent weeks writing the script. We had, I got in like six in the morning. I think we got Will and Ashley for the day. We got in super early. We did run-throughs. We got notes. We did run-throughs. Okay, so we're about to go on, and it's literally like 30 seconds before we're about to start. Will looks at me and says, I'm going to try something different. <laughs> so he goes completely off script. Um, now, I, I did improv in college. I knew the things I had to say, so I'm like, I'm just going to find opportunities to say this. Um, I did. Uh, the audience enjoyed it. They had a fun time. Um, and I, I, it, it went over really well, and, and Will was a lot of fun. But I knew that our marketing people, like, they don't like when you go off script. They kind of like when you follow the script. So I get off stage, and our head of marketing looks at me, and the very first thing she says to me is, did he just say Sphinter? <laughs> um, and anyway, the reason I chose this picture was, crazy things happen. Like I, the audience adored it. I don't think the audience had any idea that we were off script, but it was, for, for me, it was a very chaotic moment for me, and it's something I always remember. I, I actually had a blast working with Will. It was a lot of fun, um, but I, I, I will always remember that 30 seconds between him saying that before the camera started rolling, and I'm going, what? Uh, okay. Okay, picture number 19. So this is Brian Goldner, who is the former CEO of Hasbro. He sadly died uh, in 2021. Um, so for you don't know, people that don't know their history, in 1999, Hasbro purchased Wizards. And then in 2015, Brian Goldner became the CEO. And as part of that, he came to Wizards. They had their very first ever board meeting literally at Wizards. Now, for the first 16 years that Wizards was owned by Hasbro, I had never met anybody from Hasbro. Um, uh, the upper management had, but I, I had never met anybody. Um, and it was a big, big deal they were coming. So anyway, that morning, my wife and I are talking, and there was something at work that I was upset about, and my wife said that I needed to be more vocal about it. And I said, no, I've, I've, I've complained about it, I've talked to people, and my wife goes, no, you need, you need to be more vocal. So anyway, I meet Brian Goldner, the head, the CEO of Hasbro, and the very first thing he says to me is, hello, Mark, so I hear you're having a problem with and said the exact thing that I've been complaining about. So I went home to my wife that day and I goes, I think I was loud enough. <laughs> um, but the thing that really touched me was he went out of his way. Like he did his homework before he came. Brian was an awesome individual. I really liked the, I mean, I, I didn't interact with him a lot, but I really enjoyed his time. And the reason I picked this picture was Hasbro, I, I know it's, everyone loves to blame Hasbro for whatever they think goes wrong. Hasbro's actually been a wonderful company for us. They really let us do our thing, and when we need help, they're willing to give us help. And I just wanted to acknowledge Hasbro. They've really been a wonderful uh, company to work for. And I, I, know they, I, I know people love to make up stuff about Hasbro, but the reality is they're awesome for us. They've been great. And I just wanted to, hey, part of Wizards' history and Magic's history is Hasbro. Next up, 
We did a show about Kaladesh. So this was at PAX 2016. So we rented out an entire theater and filled it up. Um, next door to it was a street fair. There was a parade. The world championship was there. We did panels. Uh, we had meet and greets with the fans. Uh, we had lots of events, including, by the way, I got to play Sahili at Magic. So that leads to my preview card of today. So this is my, the one new card I get to show you. This is Sahili Filigree Mafter. Um, in the story, she's helping to ferry. They need to make the Silex. Read the story. There's a lot going on. Um, but anyway, I had a chance. Uh, both Sahili and Chandra, um, actually Christine played, uh, I talked about earlier, played Chandra. And we, we had someone else play Sahili because those were the two planeswalkers from, from Kaladesh. Uh, anyway, I had, I had a fun time playing Sahili. Another cool thing we did was we invited 25 magic influencers from around the world to cover the event. So I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. So the reason I picked this picture was for this, that outfit. Here's another look for it. So the marketing or whoever put it together the show decided that they wanted me to be more upscale. So they called this upscale plaid was, was it a thing. Uh, but when, after it was done, the response, 5% of people said to me, oh, you look nice. And 95% said to me, where's the flannel? <laughs> like, I got to look, right? Like, I, I'm known for colorful flannels, geeky t-shirts. I would say it's my brand, you know. Um, in fact, in 2015, all of R&D dressed up as me for Halloween. <laughs> um, so anyway, I found a place to use my flannel. So we told the 25 influencers that they could choose what they wanted to cover. We gave them a media room and a list of wizard employees that they could interview. My name was on the list. Uh, and of the 25 influencers, 25 chose to, in to interview me. Um, so on Sunday, I blocked out five hours. And what I did is I got 25 magic t-shirts and 25 flannels. And so for each interview, I let them pick out a shirt that I hadn't worn yet. And then I matched it with the right flannel. And then I wore a different outfit for each of the 25 interviews. Uh, and so that's the weekend. I wore a sports coat and 25 flannels. Um, I really like this event. I picked this picture because I, I love the Kaladesh event. And I, I thought that, was the, the, that five hours of interviews was very fun. Picture number 21. So this happened at Comic Con in 2017. So this is Dana Fisher. She was six years old. A almost seven. Her birthday was the next day. Um, Dana had a goal. She wanted to be the youngest person to ever date to a Grand Prix. This is a picture of her doing it. At age eight at Grand Prix Los Angeles in 2019. Uh, technically, she's tied with a boy from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, but she's the youngest girl by at least five years. And at age nine, at GP Austin 2020, Austin 2020, she became the youngest person to win money ever at a Grand Prix. Um, so over the years, she and her dad have visited Wizards. I've seen them at events. I've gotten to watch her grow up as she, she gets older. Um, and the reason I picked this picture was I'm showing you a lot of white guys up here. A, the, a lot of the hi history of magic is a lot of the same thing. And magic has changed, and magic has grown. And I couldn't think of any way to talk about how different magic has become than a six-year-old female Grand Prixer. You know, that Dana, to me, is someone who I've, I had a great joy. She's sitting here in the front row. I've had a great joy of getting to know Dana. Um, and it really was a joy. I, I really had a great time. I mean, I, obviously, I, it, it, it's been great getting to know Dana and watching her grow. And so I thought that was an awesome story. Okay, picture number 22. This took place at 2018. So it was the 25th anniversary. And, and unlike the 20th anniversary, we did almost nothing. We, we were much better about the 25th anniversary. In fact, we had six birthday parties. Uh, we had one in Grand Prix Las Vegas, which I'll get back to in a second. We had one in Grand Prix Singapore, one in Grand Prix Barcelona, one at Grand Prix Sao Paulo, one at Grand Prix Chiba, I'll also get to in a second, and at Gen Con 2018. So for all of them, we gave away cupcakes to celebrate the birthday. We had special panels. We flew people in. We ran lots and lots of cool events. And we did a special video with these three guys. Hopefully you recognize Richard Garfield, creator of Magic. 
Uh, the other guy is Peter Atkinson. I hope you recognize him as well. But Peter is responsible on the business side of things. Peter was one of the founders of Wizards of the Coast. And really, I mean, Richard made the game and make a mistake. That, I mean, the game wouldn't exist without Richard making the game. But the game also wouldn't exist without Peter make, willing it into existence as a business. Uh, you know, and Peter did so much to making magic happen. And there are so many things that could have gone wrong. But he, he, he and, and a great team around him made it happen. And me. So next year will be my 20th anniversary as head designer. So, so that means I will have been head designer for two thirds of Magic's existence, which is kind of crazy for me. Um, anyway, we shot a video. The three of us shot a video. So obviously Peter and Richard have known each other for a long time. I I've known Peter and Richard for a very long time. Um, and back in the day, there's, we used to spend a lot of time together. But you know, over time, things change and you know, I, I got a family with the, the woman who's standing there. Um, and when this picture was taken, the three of us hadn't been in the same room together in 20 years. Now, I, I still see Richard, I still see Peter, but we hadn't been all together. And my favorite part of that day wasn't even filming the videos. It was just us sitting around and just talking about the old days. And I wanted to include this picture because I really loved doing that video. And look, magic would not happen without these two guys. They really are the ones that made it happen. And so, well, I've been a proud, you know, bearer of the, uh, none of this would have happened without the two of them. I really felt they deserved their own slide, so. Okay, picture number 23. So at Grand Prix Chiba, uh, this story happened. So I've been to Japan a lot. In fact, of every country outside the U.S., I've been to Japan for magic more than any other country. And, for, and they love me in Japan. I, I'm very popular in Japan, which leads to this weird story. So for the 20th anniversary, uh, they came to me and they said, the Japanese office would like to make cardboard cutouts of you. Is that okay? Uh, I guess. So I posed for the picture. I did a bunch of poses. And then for each pose, they had me record some expression that I'm, I'm pulling in the driveway. You know what that means? I love magic. I said different things. And then I recorded it in English. And they also did it phonetically, so I recorded it in Japanese. So if you see on that little podium, you could hit the English button, hear me in English, or hit the Japanese button and hear me in Japanese. And here's some various poses that I did. Um, I picked this picture just because weird things happen in magic. And uh, I, this was a strange one. Um, I, I was told they were a big hit in Japan, so, uh, but th that, that's the story. Picture number 24. So this took place at Grand Prix Las Vegas in 2018. Yes, the same as the, the birthday one. We obviously celebrated Magic's birthday. Uh, we had panels. We had a beta draft, like we're doing the, we had, had one back then. Um, we had awesome, awesome cosplaying. This was the most amazing Karn cosplay I've ever seen. Uh, Karn was life, Nissa was not life size, but Karn was life size. Uh, that, that's Dana, that's Dana's Nissa. Um, and we just ran all sorts of fun events there. But we also had a magic wedding, a magic themed wedding. Uh, and they asked me to be part of the wedding. I read the love song of night and day, uh, which is a poem uh, uh, former editor Jenny Scott wrote. It was chopped up and put into flavor text in um, Mirage Block. Uh, and I was very honored to be part of the wedding. Now it turns out the New Yorker was there that weekend and they covered the event and they wrote a big article about it. Well, one of the things the uh, New Yorker loves to do is do caricatures. So it just so happens this moment was captured in a caricature. So I'm going to share it with you. This is me reading the poem during the wedding. Th th me doing this. <laughs> so my wife's response when she saw this, she said, they got the clothes right. <laughs> Uh, anyway, they did a lot of really fun illustrations from that event. The article, if you've never read it, it's a really good article. It's very long, goes in depth. It talks about a lot of different things. Uh, and so it was very fun. Um, and I, I just wanted to show off the, the comics because it was super fun. Um, I also made a comic strip on it, which I, it, uh, I thought was very cute, so I thought I'd show you that. Um, so anyway, the reason that I picked uh, this picture was it means so much to me when I can see magic becoming part of people's lives and the idea that people want to have a wedding and be magic themed and want me involved, I mean, really touched me. And that's a, that shows how much magic can become part of people's lives. 
Uh, and in honor of the uh, Sarah statue behind them, here is Inspiring Statuary. Once again, the normal retro and the schematic on the right. Picture number 25. So this is Alexander Smith. So uh, one day he came up to me and he said, can I hit you in the face with a pie? You know, for charity. Okay. Um, anyway, we do a thing for Extra Life where we do charity. Um, the previous year I dressed up, uh, if, if we raised enough money, I said I'd dress up like a shark to become Shark Rosewater. Um, so he said, can I hit you with a pie? I said on one condition, I get to pick the pie. I chose chocolate cream. So here is that event. So he actually made two pies, by the way. One went to my face, we ate the other one. They were handmade, uh, homemade, they were delicious. Uh, I picked this one, I wanted to show off all the work we've done for charity. I'm very proud of it, especially Extra Life and a lot of stuff. I'm glad we were able to do that. Picture number 26, uh, Josh Lee Kwai and Jimmy Wong. You might know them. They do a show called The Command Zone, a podcast. They also do game nights and extra turns. They were contacted by Make-A-Wish. Uh, a, a boy named Evan wanted to be on the podcast. And they had me down as a special surprise. Make-A-Wish likes to do that. We did, the, uh, I did the, we did the podcast together. I was on extra turns. Evan got to kill me in the game. Um, and the whole event went really wonderful. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do, not just that event, but we do about two to four Make-A-Wishes every year. Uh, I've never turned down a Make-A-Wish. I will never turn down Make-A-Wish. Um, and it was a real honor to be part of that. The idea that someone could wish for anything and their wishes to do a magic thing really touches me. Picture number 27, this took place in Los Angeles. Uh, Throne of Eldrin had a release, had a, a little theme of gingerbread people. So we decided to do a thing all about uh, uh, gingerbreads in a kitchen. This was literally shot in the kitchen of the guy who owns the production company. Uh, Cynthia Shepard was the art director. Jimmy Wong I just talked about. I, I, it was my set. Uh, and so we talked all about it. We showed off the thing of, of, of stuff to come. Uh, and the fun thing about this set was all the cookies that mattered, like showing off future expansion symbols, were done by a professional cookie maker. Uh, but for the pre-show, Liz Lamfero, who was the marketing director, thought it'd be fun to have live video where we would just make cookies while the video ran. And Liz and I got to make cookies. And we had a blast. I made that little blue ninja. I'm really bad at cookie decorating. But I remember having such a fun time and giggling through it all. And uh, I picked this picture because I love doing all the promotions. It's a lot of fun. And this was one of my favorite ones. Uh, mixture number 28, this is Megan Wolf and Maria Bartholdi. They do a thing called Good Luck High Five. Uh, I met them at the Kaladesh. Megan was covering the Pro Tour. Maria was one of the influencers I talked about. I, I got to do the Unstable and Unfinity pre-releases with them. I had the honor to be on the show four different times. We do a really cool thing called Flavor Text Theater, where we do a show called Movie Pitches. For example, Haberdash Thatcher. It's, it's a, a thriller where the cr criminal has to catch a serial killer that's killing people with their own hats. Or... Uh, go to jail is a comedy about a man that cheats a competitive um, monopoly. And we had to come up with stuff. And it's been so much fun. I love doing all the stuff I do. There's all these great people out there doing all this wonderful content. I've had a great joy doing it with a lot of them. And the reason I picked this picture was I wanted to nod to all the content creators out there. You guys are wonderful. I'm glad of all the work you do. The audience truly enjoys them. And so this was a nod to all of them and all the wonderful work they do. Um, Picture number 29, let me explain this one real quick. Code names. When I got there, we named things like Quack and Sosumi because they were all Macintosh sound files. I soon got in charge of names. Early on, they were silly. Then we started theming them like they were all Greek names or cities in Asia, but that wasn't enough. So we started putting them in order. Bacon, lettuce, tomato, earth, wind, fire. We did that for a while. Then people wanted to know how, what order they went in. So we started theming them so they went in a certain order, like these were the, the food orders. And then we started doing one ofs. The final way we did it is we just picked one theme, right now sports, and we go in alphabetical order so everyone knows their order. Kayaking is the Brothers War, which is coming up. I start wrestling next week. That's how far ahead we are. Uh, this story is about fencing, which was Strixhaven. 
Uh, Brady Bell is our, uh, he's in charge of the designer, he's uh, a manager. He came up with this cool idea that for each uh, set, we'd make an object that represented the set. It was a golf jacket or a hockey stick or a judo outfit. And then, for example, when I passed hockey as the vision designer to Dave Humphreys, who was the literal set designer, I literally would give him the object and then he would hold on to it. And so that's what this picture is. It's fencing. This is the object for fencing. Uh, the final story takes place at San Diego Comic-Con. has a warm place in my heart. Uh, I first went there in 1989. I saw my first magic card there in 1993. I met my first batch of Wizards employees in 1994. I went there the first time as a Wizard employee in 1996. Mirage was coming out. We do a lot of panels, so I talked to the people. At, and uh, in 2009, we started doing a panel there. That was for Zendikar. Uh, and then in 2016, they decided to stop doing a panel. So I said, I'm going to be there. Could I do the panel? Uh, I based it on Blogger Talk. They do my, my, my blog. So I said, let me do a Blogger Talk live. And so ever since then, I've done it by myself. So I show up. Um, except for the two years, obviously, that I was at home. Um, every year I show up, uh, I do the panel, there's signings, um, and it's become my personal magic tradition. I think everybody has their own magic traditions, and I picked this because this is my personal magic tradition. Um, which brings us to Magic 30. Um, so my final thing I want to say is, I've had a chance to walk around. I've met so many fans this weekend. I can't know, I, I don't know how many times I've signed my name or taken pictures, but one of the things that has happened is, I literally have had hundreds of people, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of people tell me how much magic has influenced them and influenced their lives and how much magic has meant to them. That means the world to me, uh, to know that we're doing something that really impacts people in a way, really has touched me. And so the whole reason I wanted to do this talk was to talk about all the cool things that magic has done, the history of magic. And so anyway, I hope you enjoyed 30 years in pictures. <laughs>